Good evening. My name is Dr. Brian Weiner. I'm the Assistant Professor of Music Education at Butler University, and I'm thrilled to be with all of our collegiate students here tonight. Um, this next 50 minutes or so, uh, we'll be doing um, a little bit of a conversation around um, something that is going to certainly apply to you right now as collegiate students, but will continue to apply to you as you move into your profession. And that's identifying how to find space for yourself in the midst of your academic and eventually professional responsibilities. Uh, we'll be doing this in a couple of different parts. Um, we're going to do this first segment right now as a pre-recorded one. Um, and then we'll be breaking into some working groups uh, that will be meeting virtually uh, via Zoom. Uh, and then we'll have a second pre-recorded session and then some working groups after that. So you have a chance to be able to talk with one another um, and be able to move forward. So this presentation is going to focus on four lies that we constantly hear um, as professionals about the way that we're supposed to work, the way things are supposed to happen. And I want to dive right into those. So that first lie that we hear is that if you find a job you love, you'll never work a day of your life. Um, and there's some truth in this. Um, I encourage you, find the job that you're passionate for. And hopefully, it's this one about music education. Um, but what I'm going to argue is that those days are still a lot of work. So but instead of that you'll never work a day of your life, if you find a job that you love, you'll love what you do, and you'll be able to tolerate the crappy parts that come along the way. Every job has its reports that need to be filled out. Every job is going to have its element that you're like, do I really need to do this? Uh, as a teacher, I love teaching my students. As a teacher, I hate grading my students. Um, but the two come right hand in hand as we go forward. So as we look at this, um, I want you to think about the way that we handle the tasks that you have as part of your life. So for those parts of it that you love, savor those. Put those at the front end of what you get to do every day. Make sure that it's something that you can really be passionate about and dedicate your time 100% to when you get to do it. By contrast, for those parts that you don't love, Figure out how to do them as efficiently and effectively as possible to be able to segment them away and not have them infect that part of the job that you absolutely love. So some ways that we can do this. First and foremost, we need to be able to identify it. By giving something a name, we can deal with it better. Second aspect for those parts that you don't love, systematize them. And this means that you create systems that make them really easy to complete. A great way to do this is setting uh, standard routines. There's a process by which you go through it. So once you start, you just are able to follow straight through. Along the same lines, we can create templates uh, for these. So for my student teacher observations, for example, um, I have a fixed template that I just have to plug the information in, the things that I observed, the things that we talked about, so that we can accurately report those. A third, ask, a third part of this process for those things you don't love is to compartmentalize them. Assign specific parts of your day to take care of those things that take up a ton of time. Email, I think, is the great best example of this. Email is constantly pouring into your mailbox. So you could spend your entire day doing nothing but email. But ideally, we want that to take up a small amount. So set aside 20 minutes first thing in the morning, 20 minutes at lunch, and 20 minutes at the end of the day. And those are the only times that email is addressed. So you can spend the rest of your day doing what you love, teaching kids. And last but not least, if you have the opportunity to collaborate with someone else that loves the tasks that you do and you can take something from them, do that. Um, this doesn't always work, but you may find that you have a flair for doing library maintenance and you just love being in your music library and your colleague hates it. Great, you're the librarian and maybe by contrast, they're the instrument repair person because that's something they're passionate about. Look for those opportunities to work with someone else to be able to support the work that you do. So our second myth is that this idea that short-term sacrifice leads to long-term success. And the problem with this is that you're going to find throughout your career that you are always sacrificing for that long-term goal down the way. Importantly, each and every day, you need to find space for you. And I want you to think about your life right now. Do you every day take 30 minutes to set aside homework and practicing and jobs and all of that just to take care of yourself? It is critically important for your mental well-being to make sure that there is time every day for yourself. And by the way, if you're looking for Waldo, he's hanging out right there over on the right side of your screen. So when we look at people who are successful and look at people who are unsuccessful, um, what we find are some common traits. 
For successful people, they do everything that they do well. And if they don't, they work towards doing that. For people who are unsuccessful, they do everything. Not just the things they do well, but they only kind of do everything. They don't fully uh, execute any of it because they don't have enough time to. They don't have enough willpower to. I think one of the hardest lessons for us as teachers to learn is the ability to say no. And it's critically important that we say no sometimes. And that could be, no, I don't have the time. No, I don't have the expertise. No, I can't do that right now. And it's not saying no and then running away. It's saying no and here's another option for you to pursue. By contrast, people who are unsuccessful say yes to everything. And we've probably all been trapped in this, having said yes to too many things and finding in the end we can't do any of the things we've committed to. I think one of the other challenging things that we, we see is that as successful people, we presume that they're just naturally good at things. Uh, but the reality is people who are successful seek out help when they need it. Um, and this can be professional help uh, in the terms of counseling, um, or it can be help in terms of learning a new skill, gain assistance in a task that you're already doing. People who are unsuccessful have a go it alone. I'm a lone wolf and I need to do this myself. Um, take the ego, take the pride out of it, and be all right about saying, I need help, I'm drowning over here. I need help, I don't have time to do it, and look for that assistance from others. And last but not least, people who are successful find time regularly for self-care. Um, may, As we look at them from the outside, we may take a look and go, they're always working, they're always on task, and it may be that some of that on-task thing is the part that is part of their self-care that they love an element of their job and that becomes their piece. But I really critically encourage you that every day you need to find 30 minutes for yourself. Your practicing is not gonna get in incrementally better if you're absolutely miserable. Your musicianship isn't gonna get magically better because of 30 minutes, but your well-being absolutely can. That project that's been taking you weeks and weeks and weeks isn't gonna be magically better because you give it 30 minutes more. But the quality of that work may be better if you take 30 minutes to do something that you just really love. So now we get to a couple of tasks that we're going to work on as a group. Um, and the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to sit down and make up a list, two columns. One, in that first column, what are things that you absolutely had to do this past week? These could be things you love doing, but what was on your list of things that had to get done? This could be work, this could be classes, it could be practicing. What could you not set aside? Second, I want you to think about the things that you wanted to do this past week. And I encourage you to include, in addition to things that you wanted to do that you were able to do, what are some of those things that you wanted to do that you weren't able to get around to? I'm going to ask you to take four minutes to work on this task on your own, and then we're going to break into groups. And I want you to talk about one insidious task that you had to do that was on your have-to-do list. And what we're going to do in that group for about, oh, seven, eight minutes is talk through how we might more effectively get that task done. And then we're going to report back to the large group. So task number one, what did you have to do this week? What did you want to do this week? And we'll talk it out in just a couple of minutes. See you soon. Hi there. Welcome back. We're glad to see you uh, sticking with us for the second portion of this presentation. Um, we're going to move on to our, our third and fourth myths of successful people. And the third myth, multitaskers rule the world. If we took a quick poll of the room, I'm going to assume that most of us would state that we're multitaskers and that we're really good at it. Uh, well, here's the reality. About 70% of people say that they're good at multitasking. About 5% of people actually are. And here's what research tells us about multitasking. First and foremost, Few people actually do it well. Um, most of us can do multiple tasks at a time, but the quality of each of those tasks gets significantly lower as we go through it. Second, what we've discovered in a learning setting is that when we're doing multitasking, when we're watching a video and reading at the same time, for example, uh, that it actually impairs our overall learning. And very specifically, the part that it impairs is our ability to bring that learning into our long-term memory. Um, so by doing multitasking, we're actually making it that what we've learned is short term and it comes in and it goes straight out again. Third, we discover that by doing multitasking, not surprisingly, we have lower efficiency overall. That if we were to do one task and then the other task separately, that it actually take less time than doing the two tasks at the same time. And while this may seem counterintuitive, the reality is it comes back again to the effectiveness 
of that uh, of both of those tasks. By doing two tasks simultaneously, we're not as effective, we're not as efficient, so we're actually wasting time, we're less effective at it when we do it, and it doesn't stick with us for long term. And really importantly for us, um, what we discovered in, again, research looking at multitasking is that people who regularly are engaged in multitasking activities have higher stress and higher uh, relevance of stress-related complications, things like blood pressure, heart disease, all the stuff that's going to shorten the quality of your life as well as the length of your life. So the challenge that we get is that we still have all these things to get done. And how do we go about that? And it goes back to the old story about how to eat an elephant. Now, you might be able to think about all the things you've got to do as we get started with second semester coming up very soon. The papers that you're going to have, the long-term projects, the teaching practicum, student teaching, juries, all those things. These are all huge moments and huge elements. So how do we effectively do eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Similarly, how do we get through all of those different things that we need to get done? We take one element at a time. Um, when people are really effective, um, it's not by multitasking, but rather it's about being able to compartmentalize down really large tasks into manageable ones. Um, a general rule of thumb is to focus on uh, things that can get done in about 20 to 30 minutes. So that might be out of that entire paper, you're going to write the introductory paragraph in the next 30 minutes. And in the 30 minutes that follow that, you're going to outline your primary arguments. And the 30 minutes that follow are going to be actually compiling that into a, a prose finished writing. And by doing that, we take this really large daunting task that's going to take us a lot of time and we make it something that I can do today and I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and I know what I'm going to do the day after that. By breaking those down into small pieces and working on them one at a time, we're more effective, we're more efficient, and we take the stress off of ourselves, leaving us that chance to say, and now's my 20 minutes that I'm going to watch a mindless YouTube video. Now's the 20 minutes that I'm going to go talk with my significant other. Now is going to be the 20 minutes that I get to just take a nap, relax, and be able to not worry about the fact I should be doing other things. The final myth that I want to put out there of successful people is that failure is not an option. Now, I think on the inside, we all know that failure is part of our learning experience. Uh, but the reality is when we look at people who have been truly successful, whether we're talking as musicians, whether we're talking as educators, scientists, business people, whatever it might be, the reality is, is failure is part of their experience. When we look at things um, like entrepreneurship, what we realize is that about one in five six businesses that are started are successful. And many of our most successful startups actually are the third, fourth, fifth product of that same entrepreneur. Failure is part of that identity. One of my favorite uh, individuals to follow for failure, despite all the other weird flaws in his life, is Elon Musk, who's founded SpaceX. Um, and he very, very loudly boasts about um, the failures that he has. Here's an example of just one of those that he posted to his Twitter feed. Now, the reality is that explosion was one of dozens of explosions that he very proudly promoted. But the end result has been that now, five years after he started that process, um, his ships are now carrying people to the space station. And he's preparing um, missions to the moon, missions to Mars. Um, and this is all because failure was something that was embraced. When that first failure was encountered, he didn't run away from it, but rather he said, this is part of this experience, now let's move forward. So I want to leave you today with a, 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 what I'd like to be, have become the Dr. Widener mantra. And that's, if, if something is worth doing, it's worth failing at the first time. And I'm going to argue not only the first time, but it's probably worth failing at multiple times over. As musicians, you've discovered that the first time you try a new skill, the first time you perform a new piece, you're oftentimes not successful. The reality is, as a teacher, the same thing is going to be true. It's a matter of taking each of those failures and going through a really specific sequence of activities. First, you need to recognize that failure has occurred and call it something. Second, reflect on the causes of that failure and reflect on the needs that I need to have in order to overcome it next time. So this really calls on us to be able to look at very specifically, why did we fail? Why weren't we successful? And then consider what resources we have that are going to allow us to move forward. Now, those resources may be, I just need another time to do it. 
But those resources may also be that I need to turn to others in my circle uh, and say, how do you do this? It may need that be that I need to go look for other materials that are gonna help support my own learning before I can teach my students. And last but not least, I need to have a specific plan for overcoming those challenges. What are the steps going to be that are going to allow me to move forward? Um, and how sequentially am I gonna do it? First, I'm gonna go educate myself. Then I'm gonna redesign the lesson. Then I'm gonna implement that lesson. And finally, I'm going to assess my students in that. In order to go through both of these steps, um, a key aspect is making sure that you create time and space for yourself. And as undergraduate students right now, you have a prime opportunity to start building these habits that are going to allow you, one, to find space for yourself, and two, to be able to incrementally break down challenging topics into small, manageable ones. So we're gonna go um, forward, I'm gonna send you out into um, a little bit of individual work time, followed by a group discussion. And I want you to think about a schedule for this upcoming semester. And I want you to think about it along four specific things. And these four specific things are in place, not just as students, but very importantly, as teachers. So on the schedule, and if you download um, the forms that are part of this uh, discussion or this um, presentation, you'll find a schedule builder there. Number one, please on this schedule, list off all the things that have a fixed schedule. Those things that you have no control over, but you have to be at. Second, you need to plan into your schedule time every single day for three meals. You need to plan into your schedule time for sleep. And I'm not gonna say that it has to be eight hours or six hours or 10 hours. I want you to think honestly about how you best function. Those are hours that you cannot touch for anything else. Third, I want you to think about the sorts of things that you're gonna have to get done. And these are your academic things. Uh, getting homework done. These are your musical things I need to practice. And these are your life things. Eventually, you need to do laundry. Eventually, the dishes need to be washed. Last but not least, and not last because it's least important, but last because I want you now to think really critically about it. Look at the schedule that you've built. Do you have time for yourself in that schedule? And this is not just time for yourself every now and then, but time for yourself each and every day. In that schedule, please make sure there is at minimum 30 minutes every day that is your time, that you're giving yourself the freedom and the license to engage in being human. When we report back in our groups, by no means do you need that entire thing already worked out. But what I am going to ask you to do is talk back within your group. What are the surprises that you have in your schedule? Do you have more time or less time than you thought you had? What is it that's really consuming your time that you didn't realize was consuming it that way? Um, and second, what are some strategies that you've found to be able to find time for yourself, to be able to meaningfully learn and meaningfully engage with others? And I'm gonna give you a challenge. In your first week of classes, try to hold to this schedule. And at the end of that week, I want you to take a look at it and reflect back on it and see if you've been able to keep up with that. And from that, build a new schedule for the following week. Our goal is that we're being honest with ourselves of how we're using time uh, and committing to that. This can be the starting point for that sort of work. So I look forward to our conversations and we'll see you in just a few minutes.